What's going on, Packers fans? Aaron Nagler here, Cheesehead TV, talking some football with my good buddy, Andy Herman, the creator of the Pack-A-Day podcast. Andy, it's not a Victory Monday, so I can't say how's Victory Monday treating you, but how you doing? It's Packers Therapy Monday, which yeah. is uh, why I always enjoy these conversations, because either we get to go over the really fun stuff on a Victory Monday, or we get to talk through it and figure out what went wrong and, and hopefully feel better by the end of the show. So uh, we'll, we'll do our best today. That's the hope, right? That is definitely the hope. Look, I think there are so many kind of obvious talking points that have been already less than 24 hours later, kind of chewed to bits online, yep. so to speak. So let's get those out of the way, right? Let's get the obvious ones. Um, first of all, I think the overarching and I said this in my post-game chat, like the overarching takeaway from that game is what a colossal team-wide letdown and or failure it is. It's like I know the impetus, the desire for people is to jump to the blame game and it's this guy's fault or it's that even that side of the ball's fault. And to me, that fourth quarter is an exemplary kind of – just lays it out in front of you for what a lack of complimentary football is leads to as far as you've got control of the game and you completely lose control because both sides don't live up to their end of the bargain. Could not agree more. 12 point lead going into the fourth. Here were the, the numbers, which are always fun in the fourth quarter. Falcons had 27 plays, 166 yards, 13 points. Packers had 10 plays, seven yards, zero points, three and out, three and out, four seven and out. Yards. Um, Lord. And yeah, that, that, and I thought that's was sort of a microcosm of even sometimes how the game went of just not complimentary football. That was right. takeaway one, a, we can always say there's a player, a coach, a coordinator, a whatever, but when you don't play very well, you know, from a complimentary football standpoint, these are the sort of things that happen when you get an interception, can you take away, you know, and get points from it. And when you, you know, get a pass interference call down the field, can you figure out a way they, I, I didn't quite realize until I rewatched, like they had the ball, I think second and eight on like the 28 yard yes, line correct. in that situation. Yep. And they don't get any points. And obviously you have from a coaching standpoint, you don't get the timeout before the kick and get an opportunity to kick that. And you have an offense that, didn't really put together drives, even a lot of their, you know, scoring plays. They had some explosive yep. plays down the field. You had the two big pass interference plays. It's a lot of six play, four play, three play, four play. And that doesn't allow your defense to get any rest. And on the same token, your defense not getting off the field is not getting your offense back on the field to get in any sort of rhythm whatsoever. And then you get to a fourth quarter where your offense isn't in rhythm, your defense is totally gassed, and that's the outcome of it. So there's a lot of little things that lead up to that, but the uncomplimentary football, I think, was the, the biggest, most frustrating part. And it's interesting. You talk about the fourth quarter and the, the defense kind of getting paper cut to death. And I think to the idea of complimentary football, they're just out, they're out there for 78 plays. I mean, that is a lot of freaking football. And by the fourth quarter, by the kind of drives that decided the game, essentially, you could tell the defense, a lot of hands on hips, a lot of like sucking wind, what have you. But man, just get off the field on third down. The problem, of course, is they're living in third and short in that game. Yeah. Third and second and short, which is a play caller's dream and a defensive coordinator's nightmare. I've seen Joe Barry getting a lot of heat, and I think some of it is is warranted, right, on this overreaction Monday, so to speak. Yeah. I will say, I think it's valid to say that Joe and the defense have this kind of this mentality, this passive mentality that drives me insane. Anyone who's watched this channel for any length of time knows. But I understand it from a conceptual standpoint of keep everything in front of you, rally and tackle. The problem is, is when you run up against a team like the Falcons, who are more than content to take what you're giving them over and over and over again, and then able to kind of execute on third down when it's third and two, third and one, what have you, with two really talented running backs, feels like you're playing into their hands. Like that's where I get frustrated as could we just once, especially against a team that very clearly doesn't want to let their quarterback drop back and throw the ball with any kind of regularity, can we just once come out of, I understand it's the scheme, but maybe adjust the scheme going in, knowing what type of team you're facing, but it just feels like we're going to run our stuff no matter what. Well, you just ran up against a team that specializes in taking apart your stuff, and that's where the frustration is for me. And I mean... Going into the game, we we sort of knew take away Bijan Robinson in the running game, which is easier said than done. The right, dude is right. yeah. phenomenal, no question about it. 
but take away Bijan Robinson, make Desmond Ritter beat you. And I thought Desmond Ritter had a couple really nice throws in this game. Um, but if Desmond Ritter goes out and throws for, if he's the one that has like the 350 yards, 400 yards, whatever, right. and he just, you, you tip your cap and say, all right, we've got some other things to fix, but we, you know, we took away the running game and, and so on and so forth. But to allow what 230 or no, 211 yards on the ground on 4.7 yards per carry, that I mean, it's just not good enough. And you knew going in that that's what they were going to want to do was sort of paper cut you to death and make it that they could continue to run the ball and get the ball in the hands of their playmakers and let them do the heavy lifting. So uh, if the idea was to make sure that they, you know, stop the run and make sure that Bijan Robinson and Tyler Algier weren't beating you and making Desmond Ritter have to beat you, that did not go according to plan whatsoever. I get that they got a little bit worn down in the third and fourth quarter. That's not necessarily an excuse. You have to be ready for that as well. But I just, I, like you said, I don't think they made great adjustments to it. I don't think they had a great plan of attack for it. And at some point, like if somebody's doing something well, you just, you have to sort of sell out to take that. Do away. something resembling anything to try and take it away. That was what was killing me. It was like a, a short sequel to the Eagles game last year where the, the Falcons just kept lining up in that pistol and you could tell, I mean, legitimately Ritter was like, okay, two man line. Okay. We're going to run up the middle. And then they would get seven, eight yards a pop, and then Joe would send in his third lineman, and they go, oh, okay, now we'll run outside. Like, it just, at some point, just, you've got to, I would think, you've got to commit, sell out, whatever you want to call it, to at least try and attempt to stop what they're doing so successfully. And it just felt like they never, ever, ever did that. Yeah, to your point, I'm so glad you brought that up. There's a there's a third down play where they've got the two defensive linemen in and Rudy Ford's trying to come up from safety, but I don't think he gets there quite in time. They hand off to Algier and Algier gets there and there is eight, there's just eight free yards. There is eight free yards. It's Van Ness one-on-one -one with the tight end. He needs to do a little bit better job of probably getting off that tight end. And then it's um, the, it's Rudy Ford coming up. But by the time Ford makes contact with Algier, who's the only person who has a chance on that play, it's it's eight yards down the field. And Ford got him down right away, which is great. But like that's a free eight yard. And you <laughs> right. know what they did on the very next play? They ran the exact same play. Yes, they Green did. Was I know the exact, the exact sequence you're talking about. It's and to so be fair, like Ford got down quicker and Van Ness got off the block a little bit quicker. And I think they held him to like four yards on the play. But that, that was like, which is still a win for the offense. Free 12 yards, just a free 12 <laughs> yards in the first down. Just being like, you know, hey, you get your free 12 yards. Get your right. free, who wants 12 yards? <laughs> right. Oh, and here's the thing I don't look, look, players got to make plays. And there were certainly plays to be made there, uh, whether it is uh, Quay Walker dropping an interception, whether it's Jair with what sure looked like a clear pick six, would have been a pick six. Those guys got to make those plays. Like, I'm not dismissing it. Certainly would change the tenor of the game. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I will say, speaking of Quay Walker, I, I thought he played a hell of a game. Like, you talk about being everywhere. And, like, yeah, 78 plays, I get he was a little – probably worn down at the end of this game, but man, he was everywhere and he was arriving in a bad mood. I love what we've seen from him so far two weeks into his second season. Probably my biggest, um, you know, takeaway from a, a positive side of things from this game was Quay Walker and, and really sort of a, a two week stack success at this point. Right. I, I thought there were times last year where he really sort of took some time to diagnose some things. I thought there were times where he didn't get off that first block very well. He's just bouncing all over the field, bouncing off that first block, getting squared up, tackling guys square. Like, I, I'm very, very pleased. Obviously, he had the huge pick six in week one. I know a lot of people, when I, when I did my grades, everyone's like, well, he had a great grade, but it was because of the pick six. I'm like, he had a really nice grade, even without the pick yes, six. And I right. thought he carried that over this week. Um, he, Like I said, he was flying around the field, really, really excited. He, he's legitimately taking this step. Now, he's got to continue it. It's just two games. We're not going to crown anyone yet. But, man, a really, really fun game from him. Let's flip it over to the offensive side of the ball. And clearly this is a game that you think they should have stole. And they were right there. They had the, you know, had the opportunity to do it. But I'll, I'll say there are no moral victories. I'm not saying anything, anything. But, I mean, to be where they were in the position to win that game in the fourth quarter, being down as many guys and significant guys heading into this game and then losing guys during the game, I'll tell you what, that's a pretty damn good job by the Green Bay Packers, the offensive coaches, what have you. But, man, it just – it seemingly – like, it's hard not – like, it gets flushed away. It, I, I just – like, I can't even really dive into it because of the frustrations in the fourth quarter, their inability to move the ball, whatever the hell's going on with A.J. Dillon. It's like 
it's so frustrating because you can see they can do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they did it all afternoon. But then when it matters most, and this is how people get judged in the NFL, both Matt LaFleur and everybody on offense seem to really kind of shrink from the moment. Yeah, that's that's well said. Um, I'm not sure how much I have to add to it other than I, you, you almost sort of liked for it to be switched in some capacity where they go down 13 points and they you know rally back and get 12 at the end but come up a point short, but it feels like they're playing their right. best football at the end of the game. I think if we would have maybe experienced that, it feels a little bit different. I think that the hard part is having that 12-point lead, feeling like you're going to go to 2-0, and and then seeing it ripped away from you that really hurts in this game. And, and just – playing your worst football at the end of the game, both both yeah. offensively and defensively. And it's hard to get into a rhythm when you're not on the field, but at the same, it's like, it's the dog chasing its tail. If the offense could just get a first down and pick up yes. a third and one, then your defense isn't right back on the field. And if your defense can get off the field on the first three plays, then your offense has a better chance of getting out there and getting back in a rhythm. And it just goes back to complimentary football. I know Matt was a little bit, you know, I think disappointed. He maybe didn't give Jordan an opportunity on the play where they went run, run, run. Right. Um, at the same token, like, the first play picks up like six yards. You're feeling pretty good after that. You get exactly. three, the, you, get, you know, the, the play after you're like, all right, third and one, maybe they should just go QB sneak on the first play and just kind of get the first down and go. We whatever. thought they were going like, on watch party. We thought for sure that was going to be a QB sneak. And then they handed it to Dylan. Yeah. And you, But you got to pick up the yard and, and we can dice into sack of like, should they have ran behind Rashid Walker and Royce Newman, the two guys that were substituting in maybe not, but like, these are NFL, like regardless, they're NFL guys, and you have to pick up a yard. And you know, Dylan obviously didn't do a great job of keeping his balance on the play. Everything was a little disjointed, but man, you, you got to pick up a yard. And then they get another three downs, and who knows what happens from there? But just frustrating all the way around. Yeah, it was funny because like literally on the watch party replay, I saw it because I was looking for something else. But when they when Dylan on second down, because to your point, look, people are grousing about the run, run, run thing, and I I get it, man. It is frustrating, but literally the drive before they'd go for a deep shot on the very first play love i'm not gonna say made the wrong read but he certainly had an opportunity down the field on the opposite side of the field he throws to wicks instead incomplete pass right then aj goes for like basically one yard maybe no yards and then the incomplete pass and they're punting right they took yep. what 40 seconds off the play so it's clear the next drive matt's like all right i need to run some clock here i'm gonna run the football and to your point successfully does so six yards of pop but literally that next that second down run when he like hit the turf i i legit said on watch party i'm like oh third and one i hate third and one with this team i don't know what it is with matt lafleur but third and one is always an adventure and you want to think we've got aj dillon turn around hand it to dillon get the yard but it never seems to be that easy and Again, I like you just mentioned, I get you've got backup offensive linemen in there, and it's certainly situational in that regard. But, man, that's frustrating when it is. third and one is a crapshoot with this team. It is. And I think part of it is, you know, I, I was looking at it, I'm like, all right, well, do you really want to run behind Rashid Walker and, and Royce Newman? And then I'm like, do you really want to run behind Josh Myers? I'm like, and, you know, John Runyon Jr. has some inconsistencies. And for right. all the greatness that Zach Thomas displayed so far, not a road grader, not a road grader, nope. right? He's not like this big time run blocker either. So yep. you're look, you're kind of looking at it and you're like, and it's Deguara, same thing. He's like kind of like that nice, you know, like he can kind of get in the way, but he's not going to just run somebody over like a traditional fullback is going to. And it's like, I'm kind of like looking at him like, I'm not sure which I, maybe between Myers and Runyon and, and hope for the best, but like there's <laughs> right. not a, a great spot to run yep. behind when you've got that five man offensive line. So I guess, you know, call the play and pray, but um, yeah, <laughs> it, it didn't work. What speaking of Walker, how do you think he did? Because it was from my, I haven't gone back and just looked at the, the coaches tape yet. I've rewatched the broadcast, but pretty up and down. And I thought it was a very kind of clear example of, yeah, he looked good in camp, and he looked good in preseason. But that's a very different animal from when people are game planning and throwing pressures at you, specifically because they know you're in there as the backup. I thought Atlanta did a nice job of attacking him in certain situations. And at times I thought he held up okay, but at other times I thought, okay, there's a reason he's still a backup. Yeah, so a couple things. I thought the first – couple series were an adventure and you know, maybe <laughs> yeah, yeah. a little bit nervous, you know, nervous for his first start and kind of going through some of that. I felt like he settled down a little bit as the game went on. Still not a great game from him overall. I also didn't think Green Bay did him any favors with the, 
Yash Rashid yes. Walker rotation. Agreed. And then when Yash was in, then they used Rashid as the extra, the extra tight end. Put him, yeah. put him on the right side. And then like he was all over the place in that game. And like for a guy making his first start and like just let him play left tackle, bring Yash in as the extra guy when you need to, and don't overcomplicate things too much. Now, if Rashid goes in and he's just struggling massively and you need to make that switch, by all means make that switch. But like Give your guy the confidence. Keep him at left tackle. Don't move him around a ton. Don't give him more to think about. Don't put more right. on his plate exactly. in this game. So thought the nerves and then just maybe asking a little bit too much from a first-time starter in that game. And it's tough, man. I mean, that's an environment to step yeah. into. It's your first NFL start. Are you kidding me? In On the fast track, first of all, in a noisy-ass dome. That place is crazy noisy. You're constantly having to look in for the snap of the ball because you can't hear. As yeah. we saw later on during the attempted quarterback sneak, can't hear anything, you know. So, man, just to go out there and get your first game under your belt in that environment, talk about a pelt on the wall, I think there will be improvement. I thought, yeah. like you said, there there's definite ups and downs, but you definitely saw the potential there. Uh, but, yeah, man, that's that's a tough ask right out of the gate. Not only that, too, but, like, you're, you're expecting Elton Jenkins next to you for that, you know, the portion, like the, right. the rest of the game. And then all right. of a sudden Elton goes down. You're not, you don't have your normal running mate out there. And then Royce Newman comes in and that's a different animal as well. So, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's a tough first ask. Um, I think he'll improve and learn from it. What did you think of Jordan overall? Because we're seeing a lot of clearly, I mean, the numbers are there, right? The pass rating's good, leads the league, or I think he leads the league outright in passing touchdowns. But, man, there are a lot of missed throws, especially early in this game, that I thought, just settle down, man. Just just breathe a little. And I think it, it looked like a product of someone who had heard all week, get the ball out of your hands quick. Get yeah. the ball out of your hands quick. They are going to be coming. It's a fast track. They're real multiple. Lot, they're going to scheme it up, and they're going to get pressure on you. Like, there were a, a handful of throws, especially in the first quarter, that I thought, man, just take a breath. Like Because, look, if he can – just hit on a few more of those early in games because it's happened now. The kind of think these first two weeks, he's really cooking with gas in that regard because he has been very, very good. Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things. A, I, I still thought this was a, a positive performance from Jordan. And I'm, I'm excited from what I've seen through the first two weeks. I do think there's a little bit of a, a rhythm passer to him when he starts getting going and in a rhythm, totally agree. like you can totally see like, Oh yeah, he's just, he's feeling it right now. And we've even seen that in camp and even in previous camps where he starts having a good day and you just know like, okay, he's going to have one of those good days good. in the summer where he's hitting Dobbs like 10 times. In exactly. A row. Yeah, exactly. Totally. So you can, you can tell when he starts dialing it in and getting into a rhythm. I thought early he was a little shaky and then late he kind of got out of that rhythm and couldn't really pick it back up either. It's interesting though. Like, from a box, like box scores are always funny because you get the a touchdown pass to Jaden Reed, but it's really just a glorified handoff and you get, right. you know, 10 yards and whatever, and a touchdown on your box score because of it. At the same token, I think probably his three best passes of the day. The oh, first one off the no flea flicker, yep. Dontavian Wicks, like he's like, he, I think he throws that perfectly right in stride. That's going to be a big play at it. Not, and obviously still was, but a pass interference doesn't show up on the box score. You've got the Dontavian Wicks in the corner of the end zone, which he throws perfectly. That's one awesome of his best play balls of the year, Terrell. no doubt. Yeah, like you tip your cap to the corner. He made an amazing play on that, but that's a beautiful ball. And then the very last throw of the game when you have to have it, fourth down, and Samori Touré, the anticipation he throws with and the place that he puts that ball with a defender right in his face, for, face fourth and 10, game on the line, and to give Touré that shot to make that catch, nowhere else to go with the ball, like – three gorgeous, gorgeous throws that aren't going to show up on the box score at all. So it's always interesting how that works, but overall still very, very encouraged. But like you said, there's times where you just need to take that breath, get back in that rhythm, maybe get him a layup on a little, you know, yeah. throw to Musgrave in the flat or something, Agreed. but I I'm excited from what I've seen through two games. It's funny. The wicks in completion of the end zone, I, that is such a perfect pass. And all I kept thinking going back this morning and rewatching it was, Man, that's where you you want to show Wicks uh, tape of Devontae oh, or, or even Jordy Nelson, the late hands, because he puts his hands out there and that alerts the DB. OK, now I can put my arm out there because I know the ball is going to be there. Like, it's just it's a little thing. Right. But if Wicks holds his hands and just puts him up there last second, it's probably a touchdown. Now, that's real easy for me to say. <laughs> exactly. here. I get it's very, very, very difficult and something you have to drill and get used to because even Devonte didn't come into the league doing that. You know, that's something he developed over time. I tell you what, though, if Wicks can learn that, because that's such a pretty ball from yep. Jordan. But yeah, that's the thing where if he's late handsing that, like it's probably a touchdown. And even if it's just 
like 80% of the corners in the league and not AJ right. Terrell, probably right. also a touchdown. Probably also like, a touchdown. Um, but yeah, true. no, I'm totally with you. And he had a nice day overall, like that you can tell, like they could have called that flea flicker on the first play to any wide receiver they wanted. I don't think it's like, I don't Fascinating, think Fascinating, right? And, and they call it to Dontavian Wicks. Right. And then they call, you know, they've got the the end zone shot to Dontavian Wicks. That He played the most snaps in week one for all wide receivers. Like he, he they trust that guy very like early. A he's lot. a very fun route runner. And he's going to be so fun to watch develop over the next couple of seasons. Couldn't agree more. Andy, always appreciate it. I feel better now. I feel, you know, no, every time, every time after a loss, talking to you, talk some football, and I feel better. I really appreciate it. Well, unfortunately, time, this is going to be the only time all year we get to talk after a loss. I mean, when so, you're going 16 yeah. to 1, you know, you got to lose one game. So exactly. that's understandable. Uh, Andy, really appreciate it, man. Um, hope everybody checks out Pack a Day podcast and the million other things that Andy is doing online to cover the Green Bay Packers. Andy, thank you so much, man. Thanks, Andy.